I got on Wish the other day and typed in Potholer 54 and, you know, sent them the 33.99 and um, this is what I got in the mail. I know from experience that some of you Hancock fanboys will complain that I was condescending to or dismissive of Mr. Graham Hancock. There's a good reason why I treat him the way that I do. I believe in treating people the way they deserve to be treated based on their behavior and honesty or lack thereof. Hancock is a lying piece of shit, and so I am merely treating him appropriately. Rather than taking umbrage at my tone, I suggest that you attempt critical thought instead. It hurts a little at first, but much like exercise, it becomes easier with practice. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye. Well, I got a hell of a deal, didn't I? He's just a peach. Well, hello and welcome to the Dunking. I'm Dan, and in this episode, we're going to Thersites the Historian. He went after Graham Hancock's ancient apocalypse. He seems to like Graham Hancock. We might revisit him. Um, I, I did call Thersites a wish version of Potholer 54, and let me be clear, it's not because he's intellectually dishonest. He seems just fine in that regard, just seems to make a lot of mistakes, really. But he, he's kind of like Potholer in the regards that he's... um. You know, you, you just like listening to his voice. He's just a really kind person. The things that he says are just, they're nice. And they, they just come across, um, you know, tactfully and, and, and politely. Over time, he began to add more and more spiritual elements to his analysis, postulating that the shared tropes and similar architectural styles of early civilization must have stemmed from a common lost civilization. Hancock's spiritual evidence included experiences that he had had while using ayahuasca and receiving visions from a goddess. Needless to say, this is somewhat at odds with his claim to be re-examining and reinterpreting archaeological data. Now, damn it, Thersites, I just got through telling everybody that you're intellectually honest compared to Potholer, and then you go and pull this crap. What is this? You do realize there's a difference between him saying, you know, I took some ayahuasca and had this vision that made me believe what I already believed, and him saying, you know, I think that these handbags on all these different things adds up to X, Y, or Z. You do realize there's like a, a massive difference there, right? And, and Hancock realizes that too, and he points it out in his books and in Ancient Apocalypse and in his Joe Rogan crap and all that stuff. He, he's clear about this kind of thing. He doesn't consider it evidence in the same form that he considers it as archaeological evidence so conflating the two is not very not a very good way to start he does a great deal to try to distance himself from the discipline of archaeology continuously dismissing archaeologists and their understanding of prehistory so to make one point you claim that he's not following through on his attempts to be reinterpreting archaeological data because he gets into the spirity woo stuff and on the other hand, you're saying that he does all that he can to distance himself as far as he can from archaeology as possible. Like what? Um, talking about woo stuff and spirity stuff? You, 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 this is what I mean by the uh, failed potholer or the wish version of potholer. This is a failed attempt at forging a narrative. You're going to have a hard time forging a narrative of the kind of person that Hancock is if you're going, huh, 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 huh. Uh, you, you need to like pick a direction and go with it. Do like Potholer does. He grabs a BS direction, just runs with it. Do that. He has clearly taken a relative smattering of mockery from a small number of archaeologists who know who he is over a few decades and used it as an excuse to hate all archaeologists. He paints them with a broad brush and speaks of them with contempt. I'm reminded of the way that activists refer to obviously corrupt industries or institutions, such as Big Oil or Big Pharma. Therefore, I propose that in Hancock's mind, professional archaeologists are the foot soldiers of Big Dirt. Graham, if you're listening, you may borrow the term, but I do request that you provide some kind of acknowledgement or compensation for my contribution to your rhetorical arsenal. You're welcome. You're kidding, right? You don't think that the archaeology community knows who Graham Hancock is pretty well? Uh, the AAS just published a paper a couple of months ago complaining about Graham Hancock. I mean, that's like a whole group of them, right? He's well known to the point where on YouTube it's standard operating for procedure for archaeologists to respond to him. Archaeologists that every other video they make is just talking about mundane archaeology stuff. They're going to take some shots at Graham Hancock because it's Graham Hancock, man. They all know who he is. 
I dare say that in 1930s, when Indiana Jones was fighting, like finding the Ark of the Covenant, that he knew where Graham Hancock was. He was probably finding, following the sign of the seal to get to the damn thing. But that's just being silly. What's really insane is like thinking that you're the one that came up with the idea of Hancock thinking that archaeology is like big pharma. Everybody else tends to call it big archaeology, but I, I guess you can call it big dirt. Um, but you sure as hell don't deserve any money for it. That'd be like me asking for money because I can't with Pac-Man, man. You're like the 53rd person on the scene 10 decades too late. Again, it's a little bit of exaggeration, but um, I believe people have been saying this for about 15 or 20 years now, so... Yeah, you don't deserve any money. What you need to do is find whoever the, said it first and throw them a bone of whatever you got for your ad revenue. What is problematic about this is that all of Hancock's raw data, all of the information that he reinterprets to fit with his own construct of prehistory, comes from archaeologists, of course. Further, even in the series, Hancock is typically successful at getting archaeologists to speak with him, even though most of them clearly think he's full of shit. They are more civil and professional when dealing with him than his attempt to generate a persecution narrative allows. Well, I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume that the reason that they're being so civil to Hancock might have something to do with the check that he's signing them for showing up on the show. Now, I could be wrong. I mean, maybe the people that operate the cameras and everybody, this is just a you know a public works project everybody got together and donated their time and energy to just to help make Graham Hancock money, including the archaeologists involved. But I, I, somehow I doubt that. Somehow I'm guessing that they probably got paid, and that might have something to do with the fact that they're willing to not be completely abrasive about it. That and the fact that there's an editor involved, right? Once there was a flood, Gunung Padang in Indonesia. The claim by Hancock and his chosen expert, who is some kind of kook who believes that Atlantis was in Indonesia, is that Gunung Padang, as an archaeological site, could date to the Younger Dryas or even to about 20,000 years ago, which would make it several thousand years prior to the Younger Dryas. And as we just get started, we get this kind of crap. That kook that believes that Atlantis was in Indonesia, you could call him a kook, or you could call him PhD geologist Dr. Danny Hillman Nadi Wajaja, who happens to have a little bit of weird beliefs. You know, you could, for example, just, just to slippery slope this a bit, we could, you know, call Sir Isaac Newton a kook because he was into alchemy, or or we could call him a mathematician. I mean, I guess it just depends on which way you want to forge your narrative, huh? The first episode was a weak start to the series, as the example of Gunung Padang does not help Hancock's case in any way. His central claim is that an ancient civilization centered on the continental shelves existed during the last ice age, and that this site is on, while the site is on high ground, the site is on a mountain. So this would not really do much to prove his idea. Wow, just wow. So because sometimes Hancock says he thinks it might be on the continental shelf, he also says he thinks it might be in northern Africa and also thinks that it might be in the Amazon rainforest. But because he says that, there's no place else that this global civilization just should go. This is that goalpost shifting. It's just absurd. It's like from you debunker types. On the one hand, you want to find evidence of this global civilization every single place in the planet. On the other hand, oh, well... That's not the place that you said that you were going to find Atlantis, so what good is that over there? That's not going to do you any good at all. It's, I mean, I get like that you're trying to debunk the guy, but that at a, at a point it just gets a little bit on the absurd. And, and I would say that this is one of them. Hancock's assumption that all pyramids serve the same function is baseless. For instance, Mesopotamian ziggurats, which are fairly similar in design and concept, were primarily utilized as temples and centers of ceremony and government, whereas Egyptian pyramids were clearly intended to be tombs for Egyptian rulers. Whoa, that's not what Hancock says at all. But let's watch the clip real quick what he says there. That these structures are universally associated with very specific spiritual ideas. What happens to us after death? This is always connected with pyramid structures. Come on, man. What do, what do you mean that he's saying they all serve the same function? He's saying that they're associated with the same spiritual ideas about afterlife and stuff. And that is kind of accurate now, isn't it? I would go out on a limb and say there's not very many of them that were not associated with the ideas of afterlife and immortality. 
So, um, you kind of had to straw man him there in order to evade that actual point that he made, which is kind of few and far between. I'll be fair, Hancock doesn't make a lot of great points in this episode, but um, when he does make one and you kind of like... Not so cool, man. Come on. For his next stop, Texaco Tezingo, which looks like a modified natural hill more so than the pyramid, Hancock finds another Atlantis nutter to claim, without evidence, that the site dates back to deep antiquity. The problem is that this site was constructed in the 15th century CE by the Aztecs, and no one else in the world disputes that. Speaking of the nutter in question, Marco Vagato, he is the source of the controversy online that you may have seen, where some archaeologists are accusing Hancock of promoting white supremacy because of his affiliation with this man. You don't mean that that's the reason they call Hancock one of those guys. You mean that's the flavor of the week. This is actually reason 4,228 that they've called Hancock that in 2023. Episode 3, Serious Rising, Malta. In the third episode, Hancock explores some interesting sites on Malta, but makes literally no points. Yes, Hancock literally spends the entire episode walking around Malta just saying, look at the pretty rocks without ever once trying to make a point. Well, you mean you don't agree with any of his points. Okay, well, I can go with that, but that's literally not what you just literally said. The episode's name is derived from another guest claims that the temples are older than the carbon dating suggest by several thousand years and that the temples were aligned to point to the star Sirius. However, a simpler explanation is that the angle of the temples helps them fill with sunlight in the morning. One of those two things. You decide which one makes more sense. As I've mentioned before, we've had real archaeoastronomers go down and do work on Malta and they've determined that Crux, the Southern Cross, is the most likely candidate for the reason that the temples are oriented the way that they are, not the sun. Now, that doesn't mean 100% that that's the reason why, but what it does mean is that this this is just one more example of this, this, this general dismissal. And for people that address Graham Hancock's work to not at least have a fundamental, rudimentary grasp on archaeoastronomy and understand at least how a hypothesis is formed and why we might consider it valid, you don't even, why do you even dip your toes in this water, man? That's like somebody attacking evolution that doesn't think that genetics is any good. It's like you're, you're never going to reach the people that believe in evolution if you're just going to ignore genetics. You're never going to reach us if you just ignore archaeoastronomy. Episode 4, Ghost of a Drowned World, Bimini Road and the Bahamas. Hancock begins this episode by promising to show us Atlantis takes us to the Bimini Road and to see some other stuff, and then shakes his head sadly toward the end of the episode and says, this isn't Atlantis. Thanks, Graham. You troll. All right, now this is really weird because he, he must have got his notes completely messed up or he must have just decided nobody that watched his video was going to have watched this anyway because that's way out there compared to what actually happened. At the end of the previous episode, Hancock says, let's talk about Atlantis. Once civilization was swallowed up by the sea 11,600 years ago, then perhaps evidence for its existence can still be found underwater. Let's talk about Atlantis. Then in this episode, he starts going off about how the Bimini Road and blah, 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 blah. And then at the end of the episode, he says this. Well, at the risk of yet again incurring the wrath of those in mainstream academia, let's talk about Atlantis. I don't believe Bimini is the site of Atlantis, or that Atlantis lies anywhere near the Bahamas. So he never promised to take us to Atlantis. As a matter of fact, he never even fully labeled Bimini as Atlantis. He just heavily implied that. And as I mentioned before, I think that that was to make the Edgar Casey Foundation happy. But at any rate, he, he doesn't say we're going to Atlantis. Oh, sorry, no, Atlantis isn't there. I don't get this whole like he's playing the shell game. That's not what happened in this episode. And as a matter of fact, again, it takes two episodes to find this. So he must have jumbled his notes up or just believes that nobody cares one of the two. Hancock's odd claims about maps from the early age of discovery, namely that they were actually based on traditions dating back to before the last ice age rather than to what were at the time new discoveries, 
was a feature of many of his early works, such as Fingerprints of the Gods. Hancock has been taken the task for this ridiculous use of old maps by Emperor Tiger Star and many others on YouTube, in addition to all of the numerous book reviews he has received over the years. Oh, I remember Emperor Tiger Star making that video to Fingerprints of the Gods. I responded to that. Here, we'll, we'll go to my video and we can just click on the link and go straight to his. Well, that didn't work. I wonder why he took his video down. There's a good deal of irony in Hancock's literal belief in Atlantis. One of the central themes of any Hancock podcast appearance is about how everyone should strive to achieve a greater level of humility. The core of Plato's Tale of Atlantis in the dialogue Timaeus is that both Atlantis and ancient Athens were humbled by the gods for their excessive hubris, and that resulted in ecological disaster. For the self-proclaimed prophet of humility to fail to recognize his favorite theme in one of the greatest works of literature to explore that idea is the height of irony. Well, this is absolutely absurd, so that you're going to conflate the story of Atlantis and Hancock talking about some spiritual thing of humans becoming too proud, too separated from nature, too above nature, and then being smote by the gods to be put back in line and to brought back down to the level that we belong at. You're going to conflate that with him having convictions about things, be them right or wrong. He has a belief. He's not allowed to have a belief that he actually holds true to. Oh, he has to capitulate to everybody else's opinions on that. Otherwise, he's being prideful. This coming from the guy that says that I invented the idea of big archaeology. Hancock says that Gobekli Tepe is being neglected. And that is definitely not true. Gobekli Tepe has been a known site for several decades, and its antiquity has been known and commonly taught as the oldest megalithic site in the world for at least 20 years. I've watched these episodes numerous times. I don't remember him saying Gobekli Tepe was neglected. So I looked at the transcript. I didn't see it there. And I'm not trying to be pedantic, not some potholer type of thing. You know, anything that would basically imply that it had been neglected, I, I would go with. But I didn't see anything that says that exactly. No, it is a position I've heard him take in other places that basically it's overlooked by archaeology for a lot of things. And I would agree with you there that it's not overlooked by archaeology in a lot of ways. Um, but I don't see it in this video. And now I could be wrong. I, I Maybe I should sit down and watch it a tenth time. But I'm at a point where I'm actually kind of sick of watching Ancient Apocalypse, which is kind of amazing considering where I started a few months ago. Hancock's new friend that he meets at Gobekli Tepe says that the symbology here refers to the stars. But that's not exactly clear. One of the points that Hancock raises at the start of the episode is that the night sky would have been easily visible every clear night and that many ancient people would be intimately familiar with where the stars are. That being said, given how clear the sky was and how easy it would have been to spot things, one can fairly ask Hancock why the ancients would orient their temples to point out certain stars when they would have no trouble finding them with their naked eye. Hancock, to the best of my knowledge, has never been asked that. He just assumes that everyone built stars or uh, built temples oriented to face certain stars and that that must have some sort of deeper celestial meaning and that it was some sort of message for the future. Well, now this is a little bit confusing to me because Thersites, the historian, claims to be an expert in Greek history. And I'm not challenging that by any stretch, but for him not to understand like a little bit of basic hermeticism was is a little weird because you would think that somebody into that stuff i mean it's not like the focus of it i don't expect him to be like running around freaking jade tablet and thoth and shit up but i expect him at least you know know who athena is right well i kind of expect you to have some idea of this but this is that as above so below shit right this is duality between sky and ground if you align this building to the star then at one time a year there's like a sacred moment with this star which is why I'll frequently this shit's done on solstices and equinoxes other sacred times of the year when the sun decided to change its pattern and this is why archaeoastronomy is really important for you guys to look into with a serious eye before you come trying to talk to us because this isn't you're not getting anywhere with this we begin the sixth episode at poverty point in louisiana a massive site that is often neglected because it is in the rural north of the state. Hancock got into a debate with the manager of the site 
over the meaning of the post holes. Although we don't really get the director's full responses due to editing. Yeah, I didn't get the director's full responses either. So you know what I did when I wanted to know? I called Poverty Point. Hey, plug, plug, there's a little thumbnail thing for when I talked to Mark Brink on the, the uh, phone there. He wouldn't let me record the conversation, but I got his answers, and they're, they're pretty straightforward. Nothing too fancy, but if you're curious, that would be the place to look. Or you could call the man yourself. As a site associated with early Christianity, the underground hive-like structure at Darren Kuyu has been studied extensively. The scholarly consensus is that the earliest habitation of the site dates to around 800 BCE, as that is the date of the earliest objects found there. However, Hancock thinks that it must be significantly older and that the impetus for constructing the underground shelter was to find refuge during the catastrophe that ended the last ice age and began the Younger Dryas. All right, now Darren Kuyu is the kind of site that I think is anomalous enough that it does kind of show where the uh, archaeological community and the scientific community just kind of shits itself looking at things like this because it's so evidence-based that it, it has to forego common sense here. Somebody who put a community that put that kind of effort into building this place up is not going to be leaving a bunch of garbage laying around. As a matter of fact, I don't think you're going to have garbage being left there until people like abandon the site. So like the first time it's abandoned, that's when you're going to start seeing junk show up. And I don't think that the site's as old as Hancock posits, but I think that but like dating it based on the oldest garbage that we found at the site basically is, is folly. I think that I think that it's extremely anomalous and for anybody to, to pin a date on it without some contemporary writing basically that says that it was built at this time I think would be just wrong. Um, it, it, it's anomalous in that regard. There's not very many sites on the planet where you can just flat out say we are not going to get any carbon datable material that will help period in the story. We're going to have to do this by other shit. And that's what you got here at Darren Kuyu. So... I think it is one of the sites that Hancock should probably, if I was Hancock and playing his his game with that stuff, I would be latching onto Darren Kuyu a lot harder. And if I was an academic, it would be one of the places that I would be have to quickly throw up my hands and say, I, I, I don't know, man. That, again, I've drawn this parallel once before, but let me, let me draw this here again. Imagine if the Colosseum was completely undateable it was made out of stone the same way and there was like stone bedrock so you couldn't dig under it and date it by based when it was there it was just a carved piece of bedrock and imagine it was as old as we know it is and it was still a site that people went to now like it is today and then tomorrow some plague came and wiped out all of humanity for the most part and it was 5,000 years before any other humans came and dug around in that spot and refound that site they can't date the Colosseum itself, like I said, assuming it's made out of bedrock. So they date the material that's there. How old would it be? It'd be contemporary to me and you, right? So it would be like a couple thousand years off. He expands upon the antiquity of great monuments by trying to find the earliest possible evidence of human activity at the site, and then hoping that viewers aren't aware that sites, especially religious sites, tend to be developed over many generations and that they become more fully elaborated and built up as time marches on. Hancock doesn't want his viewers to be aware that big temples and pyramids and stuff like that are frequently sacred sites that go all the way back to like a hole in the ground or a spring or something. Man, sure is weird that he said this in episode 2 of Ancient Apocalypse that you apparently watched to respond to. You think there was something here before that first pyramid was built? The pyramid was built over... An important spring. Yeah. Now, spring represents a, a passageway into the underworld. Mm -hmm. So it was clearly an important uh, sacred space as well as a ceremonial focus. The fact that the pyramid was the structure that was chosen to be built upon that site is not accidental. And he's been saying this forever. He's been saying it in Message of the Sphinx, for example. Him and Robert Baval talk about how the pyramids were most likely sacred sites that were slowly developed. This is why Ganong Padang doesn't matter that it has lava tubes, as I've mentioned numerous times in other videos. I don't even bother talking to you about it, which he also says lava tubes, of course. Because it doesn't matter. That's exactly the thing that Hancock would expect. That's what you would expect as well, right? It's sacred site. Like, if it was a temple, it would make sense that it was originally built on some caves. 
It's not that's not a crazy idea, right? Oh yeah, Hancock has definitely made sure that his viewers are aware of this. In conclusion, Hancock is as much of a two-bit con man as ever, and there is no reason to put any stock in anything that he has to say about human prehistory. P.S. I know from experience that some of you Hancock fanboys will complain that I was condescending to or dismissive of Mr. Graham Hancock. There's a good reason why I treat him the way that I do. I believe in treating people the way they deserve to be treated based on their behavior and honesty or lack thereof. Hancock is a lying piece of shit, and so I am merely treating him appropriately. Rather than taking umbrage at my tone, I suggest that you attempt critical thought instead. It hurts a little at first, but much like exercise, it becomes easier with practice. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye. Oh, he's so sweet, isn't he? No, seriously, this guy's arguments, like some of them were okay, but they, well, he covered the whole damn series in less than an hour, right? It's like a 40-minute video or something I'm responding to here. And the majority of his actual coverage can be summed up with, And once again, Graham Hancock made absolutely no points in this video, literally. It's, it's just lazy. I mean, it's lazy... Listen to this audio clip, for example. I, I edited all this out so you don't have to listen to it, but listen to how long he takes to just, like, shift to the next page of his script or whatever. ...of the novels in with his own life. Episode 3, Absurd, Serious huh? Rising. And we get those long form of still video clips instead of anything that's actually informative or helpful, and... It, a lot of background noise and, and poor research, minimal research, and a lot of arrogance and, and a lot of, like, insultiness. Um, yeah, this is another one of those typical phoned-in bullshit responses to Graham Hancock's work. This is, this is barely worth responding to, to be honest with you. It's, it, there's a lot of mistakes here, but it's not, it's just kind of a joke. I mean, if anybody watched this and was convinced by it, they weren't watching Ancient Apocalypse, or they just don't like Graham Hancock to begin with. This this was not going to convince anybody that was into Graham Hancock stuff at all. And now I've complained about that like being a problem with debunking videos before, but this was bottom of the barrel as far as that goes. There was no legitimate arguments in there that are going to do anything to chip away at somebody's belief in something Hancock said, because there is no detail to be brought to bear. He quickly covers each point and then just steps right on to the next and can barely be bothered to edit it and slap it out there. Because it's Hancock, man. It's easy money, right? You get good ad revenue by putting that shit out there and then you, you can just say, well, fuck you, man. You suck, Hancock. You get what you deserve. And you get comments like this. <laughs> so, yeah. Which version of potholer, budget potholer, not quite as dishonest, but, but you know, he's, he's, he's got, he, he, there's a few things in there that are pretty questionable, but uh, every bit is insulting. Anyway, have a good day. We'll do this some more later. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and um, there'll be more videos coming down the pipe soon, I promise.